Well, uh, hello everyone. I'm excited here at the Distributed SQL Summit 2024 to share what SKO is doing with Distributed uh, SQL. Uh, my name is Mauricio Zambrano. I'm the database engineer at the Square Kilometer Array Observatory, and I'm currently based in UK. So let me share the presentation with you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the 21st century is uh, for astronomy and radio astronomy a very exciting time uh, because we have uh, many uh, working observatories and new observatories uh, that uh, will start to look in a different uh, portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, you can have, for example, in the radio uh, uh, spectrum, you can have, you will have the square kilometer array observatory. Uh, currently, you have uh, the ALMA observatory uh, looking at, at those frequencies, and also United States will start building the NGVLA, uh, which is uh, an upgrade of uh, an observatory that currently exists there. And of course, you have, uh, uh, for example, the big uh, optical telescope, the ELTs, uh, that uh, are uh, currently being built uh, in Chile and in Hawaii. And also you have another uh, kind of uh, observatory that would look at specific events uh, li like gamma ray. This is the Cherenkov telescope array. So uh, in order to, to build the, the SKA observatory, the square kilometer array observatory, uh, there were uh, many different instruments that were created to see uh, the feasibility of, of uh, such instrument. And for example, you have here all the pathfinders in different countries, in Canada, in Europe, France, uh, United States. And also uh, there, there were two pre precursors by, per country. Uh, those are currently observatories that are, are in use. And uh, for example, the Meerkat, uh, it look at those frequencies. And it uh, it is currently in operation, and at some point in time, it will be part of the square kilometer array. So, uh, what can you do with uh, those observatories? Uh, one of the new exciting things that you can do is uh, looking at uh, gravitational waves. Uh, this is something quite new. So, how does a scientist uh, do these kind of things? They look at uh, specific stars in the sky and see the difference, the time shifting uh, when a, a gravitational wave uh, pass between the observation and the, the pass of the, the emission from the, uh, from the star and where the, the dishes are. So uh, this is kind of uh, a new application for a, a radio telescope, uh, which is uh, quite interesting because they, it allow you to observe uh, those uh, 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 those uh, events. So uh, the Square Kilometer Array Observatory is a global partnership. Uh, it's uh, composed by 16 countries, include uh, nine full members. Uh, we have 11 countries of G20, six of the G7s, and three of the BRICS. Uh, we also have eight African partners. We cover five continents and we have, uh, we are a collaboration, North, South and East, West, and we have uh, 17 time zones from Vancouver to Sydney. And uh, last time I counted, we are more than 30 software teams distributed, uh, well, on, in, on all those places. Uh, the different states, they have different uh, membership. We have member state and we have observers and uh, we, we will, probably have more, more countries joining the, the project. So uh, what are we building? Uh, I am already speaking about the requirement of the observatory, and th this is kind of important for what we are going with the data. Uh, we are going to build one observatory with two telescopes on three sites. Uh, this is a picture of the HQ here in the uh, UK at Jodrell Bank. And uh, the sites where the telescope are located are in the Western uh, Australia and Karoo Desert in South Africa. And they were selected uh, for their uh, radio quietness and the low population density. 
The first release of data to the community will happen in 2026, 27, and we expect to produce uh, science data uh, around uh, 70, uh, 10 petabytes per, per year. And uh, the final uh, deployment of the S SKO will be a phase two, uh, which uh, is going to be several times uh, larger than, than what is currently uh, in place. Uh, for example, the SCAMI telescope, with, will, which will be in South Africa, uh, has a, a 150-kilometer extent, and it will be made of uh, about uh, a little less than uh, 200 dishes. And uh, it will include the 64 uh, Mirkat uh, uh, dishes. And the frequency range that it is observing are between 35 and 15 gigahertz. Uh, on the other hand, the Scalo telescope will be located in Australia and it has a 74 kilometer ex extent. And uh, we will have uh, a f a 512 stations like this, and uh, each one of them will have 256 antennas and it will cover another frequency range. For uh, all those uh, instrument uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, of infrastructure work because there will be a lot of cabling uh, electricity power and uh, all those things that are needed uh, to to have the observatory working so uh, to me the the most uh, interesting part of of the data processing is probably the science uh, data processor uh, uh, because uh, and and this this path will be the one that will be uh, really uh, processing the 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 biggest amount of of data. Uh, for example, in the case of the Scalo, it uh, will produce two petabytes per seconds. Uh, this is the shape of the antennas; they look like a pine tree. And uh, with all the antennas, uh, we will uh, need to process eight point nine terabytes per seconds. At a, a central correlator, uh, we will have here a, a dedicated uh, computer to 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 do just uh, the specific calculation, and uh, also uh, form the uh, the the beamline the beamline former, and uh, then uh, all this data will ha have to be moved to to a to a supercomputer that uh, will be uh, in Perth for Australia and in Cape Town for South Africa. And uh, we will uh, produce around 700 petabytes per year. So the, the innovation here, uh, and, and maybe uh, this will be the first observatory that uh, will not have enough space to, to store uh, all the information that uh, we are getting from the observation. We will have to process quickly and deliver it quickly to the regional center. So this is kind of new for, uh, for astronomy. Uh, so the timeline of the observatory, uh, it started in 2013 with the telescope design and uh, the institutional uh, net framework for, for this organization. On uh, 2019, uh, there was a treaty uh, signed by seven countries. On 2021, the organization was born. And on February 2021, the first uh, council meeting uh, took place in uh, June 2021, uh, the Council approved the start of the construction and the activities of the construction started on July. And uh, in December 2022, uh, the site construction commencement ceremonies uh, uh, took place. And uh, we had, uh, well, last year we had 79 contracts awarded and this, is, this number is increasing, of course. So the construction strategies, uh, we, we start building a very small uh, telescope uh, and then we will add uh, new elements. And each one of those steps uh, will deliver a specific uh, functionality uh, to, the, to the community, well, for, to, to science. Uh, so not all funding is yet secured, uh, but uh, the plan is to, to to deliver in uh, 2028 uh, the one of the last version of the of the observatory. 
Uh, at this moment, we are uh, we are working on AA uh, on the uh, AA 0.5, uh, and it will consist of four dishes uh, in South Africa and six stations in Australia. Uh, the first dish uh, was just installed, uh, started to be installed uh, in February this year. And also the, the first uh, uh, station is uh, starting to be built in Australia. So uh, another important date is that uh, we expect to deliver the first uh, science data for the community in uh, 2026 or 27. So uh, at some point, the SKO will uh, be the, the, the most powerful ray observatory on Earth, and we expect that to be in 2026. Uh, of course, to, to build uh, all, uh, all the observatory, we will need uh, infrastructure in place, and uh, we have uh, installations in Cape Town, Perth, uh, and we have also support bases uh, close to the telescopes. Uh, and you need to have people building uh, the observatory and we have, uh, well, staff in uh, South Africa, Australia and UK. Uh, so the activities of construction, uh, the first dish was installed in February last year. It was uh, made uh, in China and it was uh, moved uh, to the site uh, in February, and it is currently being installed. Uh, the construction site also in South Africa is starting to build uh, the first uh, station. And uh, uh, also uh, SKO is part of uh, initiative to protect the, the clear skies uh, for astronomy because uh, you know that uh, right now there is a, a constellation of uh, satellite that uh, may uh, damage the, the observation of, uh, of the skies. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to speak about uh, the, the software part of the telescope. Uh, we, we use the safe agile practice uh, in other telescope and we have, uh, uh, we have uh, some planning increment and, and we do in a two months uh, Print. We we do we, we deliver our our software. SKO is uh, fully open source. Uh, most of our code is on GitLab, and the one that is not on GitLab is uh, probably uh, because there is some safety uh, security issue. Uh, we deploy everything on Kubernetes uh, on premise, and uh, we use Ansible most of the time to to deploy things with no human intervention or the minimal one. And uh, uh, to to move the antennas and to uh, control all the hardware we have, we use a control framework uh, that is called Tango. Uh, this is an open source uh, control system that you can download for free and have it in your computer. Uh, most of the code is written in uh, Python. And uh, if we need some uh, special things, it might be that uh, a few things are in C++ and we also have a, C code uh, that runs on uh, on FPGAs. Uh, if we look at the databases currently in use, it, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, we if you look at the database uh, currently in use, uh, it will depend on on uh, the software requirements. For example, we we are using Tango, and Tango requires to, uh, to have a, a, what is called an archiver. And uh, this run in PostgreSQL and with a timescale DB uh, extension. Uh, but uh, for example, if uh, for the Tango control, uh, there is a resolution service and this is maintained in a MariaDB system. And we are kind of forced to use it right now because there is no uh, port of PostgreSQL for that. So we are stuck with MariaDB there. And uh, to have a displays of uh, the soft, the the devices status, we use another uh, Tango software called Taranta, and uh, that one uses MongoDB to to store uh, the panels. Uh, one of the 
uh, important uh, piece of code there is called ODA. Uh, this is the main system that allows to move the metadata of the of the proposals uh, of the observations. And uh, this one uh, is a is a web system. It's run on, on an API. It's written in Python, and the backend there is PostgreSQL. So uh, what are the challenges uh, do we have? We, we must do replication. And uh, as I told you, we have three sites. We have the HQ, we have the uh, mid uh, in South Africa and the low sites in Australia. So uh, again, we are one global observatory, two telescope and three sites. Uh, proposal submission when the astronomer uh, want to observe something, they uh, have to uh, they will have to to uh, uh, to connect to the HQ and uh, and, and post their uh, their uh, observation. Also, uh, we will have a team of uh, supporting astronomer uh, in UK uh, doing the observation design and planning, and also uh, they will uh, have project tracking in UK. So the observation scheduling and execution, of course, will happen uh, close to the telescope in South Africa and Australia. And the data processing uh, will happen uh, close to the telescope. And uh, finally, data has to go back to UK. And uh, from U UK, it will tra be transferred to the SKO regional centers uh, to all the partners of the project. So. Uh, one of the main things I've been looking at is uh, how do we replicate uh, data around? And we, we have here uh, three different sites and each one of them is writing uh, information and we need to replicate uh, with PostgreSQL. Uh, so we have a multi-primary replication uh, and we need to, to, to know how to implement this on PostgreSQL. If you look uh, currently at uh, what is available, uh, there, re there are a few, uh, a few things uh, that, that you can do. Uh, for example, there is a PostgreSQL extension called Spock, uh, which is open source, and it is uh, developed by a small company called PGH. And uh, they offer uh, an option to do multi-primary replication. Uh, also, uh, EDB, the big uh, PostgreSQL company, has a, has a PostgreSQL uh, version which is dedicated to multi-primary uh, replication. And of course, you have uh, cloud services uh, that allow you to do uh, multi-active uh, services. Uh, AWS uh, started offering a product uh, last October called AWS PG Active. Uh, well, you have to look specifically at each one of those products and, and of course, uh, read what are the limitations of, of each one of them. Uh, for example, Spock and uh, PG Active do they do not replicate uh, DDLs, so this is not super good. Uh, and uh, also, they have limitation on the type of uh, data that they can propagate uh, or not. And other option would be we can use maybe the new SQL database and there uh, you can have a, a look at Gigabyte or CockroachDB. Uh, so uh, one of our main uh, problem here is geodistribution. Uh, how, how do we move uh, data around? Uh, and, and we have a few requirements. For example, we, we need to have a low latency. We cannot expect to insert a data in a place and wait uh, maybe one second. Uh, that, that's probably too much. So uh, each site uh, should host its local uh, data partition and each site should, should be able to operate independently uh, of the status of the other site. Uh, we, we don't want to be too dependent to, to one to another. And uh, uh, to to see what's going on in other places, uh, we can had we can accept some uh, some delay in the information we receive from the from the telescope, and fifteen seconds delay seems to be okay for us, and and we don't worry about that. So th those requirements are, are are very specific to our telescope of our our problem. Uh, they might or might not match your uh, what what you need to do. 
Uh, but for example, for this uh, 15 seconds delay, then we can use something uh, in Gigabyte called follower read tables. And uh, that's uh, that's okay for our uh, uh, use case, and it also protects us in a case of an outage uh, to to one of the telescopes. Uh, so in Gigabyte, uh, what what do you have uh, that is uh, interesting? Uh, this is the the uh, something called uh, row level geopartitioning. They have a very nice tutorial on it. I, I will not explain all the details here. But uh, basically, you, you, you define a type of space with a specific location, and uh, the, the data uh, will be uh, specifically located in that place and will not be moved around. Uh, then after that, you create your table uh, with an additional uh, location column, and you have to create a partition for your tables. Uh, if if your data is closer to your application, you uh, lower the latency. And uh, if you want to move data around, you just have to do a, an uh, an update and uh, change the location column to the place you want to your data to be to be. Uh, so this is quite convenient. But uh, this is uh, somewhat a changing paradigm because uh, your developers have to be aware on on how they move things around. Uh, Sometimes when you use uh, something like something like a replicator, uh, you just uh, ha you, the, the developers they don't care much about uh, how, how data is moving around. It's uh, a configuration thing, but here they have to take care on, on how they move things around. Uh, about follower reads, uh, well, uh, in our case, uh, having stale data is okay and is uh, much better than have nothing. And uh, eventually, uh, after some time, uh, all uh, data will be uh, there and it will be the, the right data. And uh, if we lost a uh, connection to, to one of the telescope, uh, having stale data is still good enough maybe to do, to do the, the, the work that we need. And querying the follower table is always uh, much, much faster than uh, going to the remote server and uh, querying the data around. And uh, your remote uh, reads uh, will be kind of heightened uh, by, by uh, doing this query to the local follower read. Uh, so uh, our evaluation of uh, Yugabyte at scale, uh, what, what we like about, about the product, uh, it is an open source database. Uh, you can have the, the source code at GitHub. Uh, it is Kubernetes enabled, so this is nice for us. Uh, there is also an operator, which uh, we plan to use uh, probably. And uh, uh, the, the most important features uh, that allow us to, to, to do what we want to do with, with no extra license uh, cost, uh, the multi-region deployment on-premise are on cloud uh, providers. You can have it uh, with the with the uh, Yugabyte you get from, from the uh, GitHub or from the Yugabyte uh, uh, download page. You also have table geo-replication, you can have follower reads, and you can have uh, incremental backups available uh, for almost for free. Of course, you have the support option, and uh, uh, well, uh, Yugabyte is uh, very good at, at uh, giving support. They have their uh, Slack channel uh, and uh, Slack servers, and they also uh, are usually available on the. Uh, well, they they are also available on the uh, PostgreSQL Slack uh, channels. Uh, of course, one one of the main uh, features that we also like is the compatibility with PostgreSQL. Uh, we are developing for PostgreSQL and, and having co uh, compatibilities is also needed for us.